I would like to welcome all the participants of this webinar from the heart of the Kingdom of Eswatini. It is a great pleasure for us uh, to have you on board and a special welcome is extended to our speakers today, Professor Meshak Aziakapono and Professor Bonang Mohale. I would like to apologize for Mr. Mvuselelo Fakudze, who is also part of the panel of speakers who unfortunately has had to accede to an urgent call to the Royal uh, Residence for a meeting which relates to progress on these projects that we are talking about today. Eswatini is not immune to the current situation that the whole world has faced in the face of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, which has affected a whole lot of uh, sectors. And as a result, the Eswatini uh, government decided to embark on a journey which would uh, complement the national, uh, uh, the national uh, development plan in as far as uh, resuscitating the economy, which has been negatively affected by the uh, pandemic. We would like to thank our speakers uh, for participating in this webinar hosted by Eswatini. Now, our program for today is uh, not going to take away most of your weekend. Um, we will start with a global uh, perspective on economic recovery strategy. We will start with a global perspective on the economic recovery strategy after COVID-19 lessons and implica implications, which will be uh, discussed by Professor Meshak Aziakapono, a USB faculty professor of development finance. The second uh, session uh, oh. will the second section, the second session will be uh, conducted by Professor Bonang Mohale, who will be sharing perspectives on the economic recovery. And then finally, um, if um, uh, he joins us, uh, otherwise I will do a short overview of what strategies have been put in place in the Kingdom of Eswatini in preparation of um, uh, bankable feasibility studies uh, to make sure that these projects uh, come into fruition uh, in the short uh, period. Now I would like to introduce Professor um, Aziaka Pono on the panels. Professor Aziaka Pono is a professor of development finance and head of development finance programs at the University of Stellenbosch Business School from 2021 obtained a bachelor's uh, of science degree honors in economics and statistics at the University of Benin. The degree of master's of science in economics at the University of Ibadan, Nigeria, and a PhD in economics from the University of the Free State. His PhD thesis titled The Depth of Financial Integration and its effects on financial development and economic performance of the Southern African Customs Union countries, won the Founders Medal for the best PhD dissertation in economics in South Africa. He joined the University of Stellenbosch Business School in February 2010 as a professor of development finance and was head of development finance programs in the school until 2013. Professor Aziaka Pono was a consultant for the OECD Center and African Economic Research Consortium, AERC, a visiting scholar to the International Monetary Fund in Washington, DC, USA, and a visiting scholar to the INSEAD in Singapore. He has served as a member of academic board of economic research 
Southern Africa and as a peer review member of research process and at the University of Johannesburg, Faculty of Economics and Financial Sciences. We are glad to have you, Professor. And I am glad to see that there are quite a number of uh, uh, alumni in Fumilukele, Krista um, Bahat Sanga, and Defunega Bata. You are welcome uh, to this uh, webinar, Professor. Thank you so much for that uh, kind uh, introduction, NS, uh, Mr. Ernest Mkunta. Uh, I hope I pronounced it correctly. <laughs> I really, it's always a privilege and honor to talk to our alumni um, uh, wherever they are. And it's, this is part of initiative to continue to uh, enhance um, their knowledge, or especially on contemporary issues that are happening uh, around the world. So a time like this with the COVID-19 that has plagued the whole world, people are interested to know how this pandemic has affected countries and what efforts have been made to recover and where we can learn lessons from such effort and what we can do in our country. So uh, for the kingdom of Esratin, which I'm particularly very fond of, uh, I've visited there now, I think about three times. It's always a, a pleasure to be there even though we cannot be there physically in this particular occasion, it is good that we can be there virtually and I can see friends, uh, people from that place. So I'm really delighted to be part of this uh, event today. So I will share my PowerPoint, uh, some of what I will talk about in the PowerPoint, but I will talk beyond what is on the, the PowerPoint. I have some points to use on the PowerPoint. So I will quickly want to share the PowerPoint Do you see the PowerPoint? Uh, All right. That's correct. Yes, it's. Uh, I can see it. Thank you very much. So, the what I've chosen to be the title of this discussion is uh, "Global Perspectives on Economic Recovery Strategy After COVID-19: Lessons and Implications for the Kingdom of Eswatini." As you would imagine. Um, Globally, the, the pandemic is really raging. We wish we can begin to talk about the post-COVID now as if it has passed so that we can begin to talk about a, a strategy uh, after COVID uh, have ended. But unfortunately, it's still raging. And as we can see from the figures, the, 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 the uh, infection rate at this moment in some of the developed world, US and Europe, you can see that the, the rate of infection has actually is still escalating. So this is not a time when we know for sure that we have overcome the pandemic is still raging. But if you look at this data up to now, uh, so I got this data today from the World WHO, um, 51 million people have been affected. And unfortunately the world have lost according to the record over some 1,280,000 people. That is tragic. Um, of course, sometimes uh, the statistics may not capture everything because quite a number of people that must have died of the COVID may not have been recorded. So we can imagine that the data, uh, the statistics is more than this. And um, Africa has also been badly affected. Some 1.3 million people have been affected. So this pandemic has really affected the world. It's a health issue, a health problem, but it is not just a health problem, it goes beyond health problems. So in my presentation, I will just briefly talk about the impact of the COVID-19 and uh, look a little bit more into the impact in Africa. And then we look at some of the global response um, uh, and African response to the COVID and the option for dealing with the long-term uh, effect of the, the COVID. So if you look at the, the impact, um, when the COVID started as part of the effort to uh, uh, COVID, the countries implemented a lockdown, complete lockdown in most uh, many countries, 
And in some countries, like we just heard um, uh, in the, the Kingdom of Eswatini, it was more partial uh, lockdown because when you have complete lockdown in certain, certain situation, such a lockdown could actually paralyze the economy as it has done in many countries. So that was the effect. And you can just imagine in an, uh, a situation where uh, you, you lock down the economy, there will be slowdown in economic activities. In fact, economic activity was brought to a near half for many uh, countries. How would this event play out? It started as a pandemic. With the lockdown, it filtered into economic activities, which we expect to lead to recession, which has happened in many countries. And such a recession could lead to a, a, a global financial crisis. And if such a crisis were to happen, it then would lead to uh, a further recession, which if case not taken, depending on the duration, it could lead to a depression, which is what nation fear. And if you look at the, the history of um, uh, countries experiencing um, recession in the world, the projection is that in 2020, by 2021, the world will be having close to 100 countries that will be experiencing recession because of this pandemic. And to put it in perspective, if you look at the history from 1879, you see the number of countries at other time in history where the world has experienced um, either economic crisis or um, other pandemic. So if you look at the, the previous ones, uh, in the 1918, those early period, and if you look at the global uh, crisis depression of that time, just a little above 80 countries suffered economic recession. But we are saying that now it's a little less than 100 countries will likely enter recession. So that shows you, that shows us that this is unprecedented what the world is witnessing now in terms of the scale of effect of the, uh, of the crisis. And uh, when we think in terms of how will this impact on Africa, uh, of course, African countries will suffer recession. We can look at it from two perspectives in terms of how the effect will be transmitted to Africa. But we can look at external effect, which we look at exogenous effect. We can also look at internal effect, which we call endogenous effect. The exogenous ones will come via the decline in tourism. So many African countries uh, benefit from tourists that are coming to the economy and it, it to create opportunity in so many sectors that deal directly with the, 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 the tourists that uh, visit. And the, the spending power of the tourists in the country also help to, to boost the economy. But with the, 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 not just a decline, a significant decline in tourism activity during this pandemic, because travels are bound or restricted, we can imagine that that sector is badly affected in all countries. So it's not limited to Africa, but more globally, that has been affected. Then decline in remittances from African diaspora. One of the things that has happened in the past couple of years is that Africa, Africa has exported many diasporas. And if you look at the, the, in terms of the export of Africa to the rest of the world, we, we will notice that the countries where the pandemic uh, was so severe in Europe and America, North America, are the countries where most of the migrants do go to. So 75% of the migrants go to those countries. And of the global, 90% of the global remittances are sent by migrants from these countries. So if we can just imagine that Europe and America are so badly affected, we will expect a significant depression in the inflow of remittances that will come to Africa. And it is estimated that that could be so close to some 110 billion uh, US dollars. So that helps us to see how terrible the, the, the economy of Africa will be affected via this channel. Then foreign direct investment is another channel through which uh, the, the, the economy of Africa is, is financed, uh, investments from such um, what, uh, multinational corporations create opportunity in on the continent, and one of the desire of countries is to attract as many as possible of such investment. 
with this global pandemic, we will see a significant drop in this uh, on the African continent. Then official development assistance. So there's a, a misbag here. We will we'll see a situation where in response to the COVID, there will be increase in some uh, official development assistance that will help to try to push on the effect of COVID. But the other development assistance that went into other aspects of the economy will, uh, will also be reduced. So in, on the net, probably we will have less of our own uh, official development assistance that could be going to Africa than it was uh, before the COVID. With the fall in oil prices and commodity prices, many of African countries, depending on these resources like Nigeria, Angola, and many of these countries, including South Africa, will suffer terribly in terms of the foreign exchange earnings that will have come from these sources. When we look at the endogenous effect, we, we, we are talking here um, in terms of disruption of economic activities, and it will lead to a significant decrease in tax revenue because as businesses are not operating or making profit, there will be less uh, opportunity for uh, taxes and individual income losses will also mean that tax, taxes will also be reduced. Such, uh, uh, there will also be loss in revenue due to falling iron and commodity prices and increase in public expenditure. So there is a double tragedy here or problem. One, you see a, re a significant reduction in revenue, but there's a significant need for government expenditure. So how do you balance it, the thing? And um, this is where borrowing will, will occur and probably reallocation of the budget will also take place. Decline in exports is also another aspect. And the financial sector, as we talked about, if the financial sector is significantly impacted, of course, in a time like this, uh, they, they, they also become risk averse. And with the risk aversion, lending will be reduced. And when economic activities are not, are not financed, that will further lead to um, a, a negative effect on the economy. When we look at the global response, how has the globe the countries responded generally? So first, there was a significant fiscal support uh, for healthcare. So building new facility because no nation was well prepared for this um, um, uh, development that occurred, the pandemic. Nobody, was, no nation can, even the most developed world, none of them was well equipped in terms of resources to handle the, the, the equipment, the, 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 the health crisis. So in addition to that, because of the loss of employment or loss of income, there was a response from fiscal support to where cushioned effect on the individual um, uh, and household. And then businesses were also uh, support, most of the, those that are seen to be very uh, important. In addition to fiscal support, there were also monetary policy uh, responses. This uh, in form of reduction in the official rates, which then mean interest rate went down. And with that, it helped to uh, reduce the burden on businesses either that are owing or that want to borrow. Then open market operation as a mechanism to raise more uh, funding uh, by, by the, the central banks, then foreign exchange market uh, interventions. In addition to the monetary policy, there were also physical, sorry, financial sector policies in form of credit guarantees. Uh, this has been a very important tool and it has been used historically when there are economic crises. Then supervisory support for loans restructuring, uh, regulatory support for banks, use of uh, available capital and liquidity buffers to support uh, lending. So all of these had helped. That was a global picture. By and large, most African countries have followed the same measures in trying to uh, cushion the effect of the COVID-19. So the mechanism that have been used in the in the interim to intervene, to try to prevent the adverse effect of the, the COVID pandemic were similar to what other nations globally have done in Africa. What are some of the strategies uh, for dealing with the long-term effect of the pandemic? So I look at strategy from the point of view of the, 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 the government. If you look at the, the literature, the summary of what nations have been doing in terms of 
trying to respond to the, the, the pandemic, governments generally, as we go forward, will continue to create emergency fund to scale up social protection. And to do this largely, as we have seen in many countries trying to do, there will be exist, uh, adjustment of existing budget allocation, and there will also be need for uh, finances. So what many nations have done now, uh, have been doing, is to see where can they take funding from to be positioned to ensure that there is social protection and that the, the, the life of people are protected in terms of uh, the livelihood continue to be protected. So if you think in terms of um, uh, South Africa as a country, uh, in addition to the fact that the, uh, the, the state of the, uh, the disaster has been extended, there is also a continuation of some of the relief fund, UIF uh, funding and many other support that are given. So with all of this, it helps to cushion the effect on the household and individuals. Then there is increase in funding for medical research, uh, medical facility provision and so on. And that will remain because the, the need to continue to ensure that uh, there are intervention in form of discovering appropriate, most effective vaccine and other form of treatment of this uh, pandemic and other uh, diseases will, uh, will, will, will continue to dominate in terms of the attention uh, going forward. So that will be part of the effort that the government will be. I found this very interesting, the, the paper by this, um, the, the, the document by the the donor committee for enterprise development. They summarize a number of interventions that has been used globally. So one of them um, is effort to, by the government to mobilize the private sector to support recovery. So it is not going to be practically possible for the government to do this alone in terms of providing resources to be able to cushion the effect of the global pandemic. So the need, there is a need to mobilize the private sector, and that is cutting across uh, nations. It's a common theme that is emerging. Then there's also uh, prioritization of uh, business environment reforms that are critical uh, enablers of recovery effort. So many of these um, reforms that are necessary, I think this is the opportunity for countries to look into them and see how the ease of doing business, what those reforms are that can help to uh, uh, enable the, the ease of doing business that would make it easier. So access to financing, how can we make that uh, possible? These are part of the, 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 the theme that is occurring and is featuring in terms of the strategy that is going on uh, uh, globally. Then there is also continued support for micro, small, medium enterprises uh, to ensure that they continue uh, 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 remain for, um, uh, as a going uh, business and that those who are already suffering can recover. Then there is this um, effort to uh, promote greener growth. And it is basically to it's, it's part of the building back better agenda. And the whole idea is that the COVID has created an opportunity for country to now say, we can prioritize on those, some of those strategic initiative or strategic sector that um, countries have not been able to invest in before now. For instance, the renewable energy, those sector that will help to uh, um, uh, lead to growth. So this is an opportunity for the government to be able to invest infrastructure, for instance, in many countries. This is an opportunity to invest in those infrastructure so that it can help to stimulate um, uh, growth. In addition to that, if you think in terms of what has happened during the global, pan uh, global pandemic, the, the, the global supply chain was disrupted and many countries in Africa were badly affected. And globally, this disruption of the, 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 the value chain is something that is beginning to uh, gain attention of, uh, as part of the strategy to, 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 to cushion or to uh, take recover from the, the effect of the COVID. So what is the key element here? The, the, the key element is that the group value chain need to be more uh, efficient and more sustainable. 
So there is that desire to ensure that there's more um, efficiency and then sustainability of the global value chain, and more so for the de uh, developing countries uh, in particular. Then creating economic opportunity for women and other vulnerable groups. If you look at the population of Africa, and when you think in terms of the proportion of African uh, women uh, globally too, and um, um, vulnerable groups, more so the youth, you will realize that there is a need to create opportunity. And that theme has uh, come across in terms of the strategy for recovery. One of the things that has become very clear during the global financial crisis, uh, sorry, global uh, pandemic is the role of technology. Digitalization is becoming one of the key efforts. So digitalizing the economy to promote um, uh, the, the recovery is becoming a key element. So migration into from the normal traditional way of doing business to digital um, innovative way of doing things is going to be a key uh, tool for recovery. And what is very important about it is that many sector or most of the promising sector for promoting skilled jobs and encouraging business uh, startups is going to be in the digital technology um, uh, sector. So there is need to promote them. When we talk about African, there are also some particular effort that need to be made. So for instance, uh, promoting solidarity and what area would this be uh, 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 um, encouraged? I will say that Africans should not miss this opportunity. This is an opportunity for Africa to move together to see what can we do to promote uh, our joint or collective um, uh, opportunities. So one of the initiatives that is occurring in Africa now is the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. It has been signed. I think this is opportunity to speed diplomatization up so that it can open avenue for trade within Africa. And you can just imagine when that happens, Suppose, um, uh, as we are recovering from COVID, it can lift the economy of the countries. Then the need to lead effort to secure debt cancellation. So much of the debt burden that the government have incurred, uh, that is emerging, that has been coming historically, and that is going to increase during this period, need to be looked into. So African countries need to pull together uh, move in a solidarity form uh, to ensure that they push for debt cancellation so that by writing up the debt, they can also have the, uh, the, the enabling environment to start afresh. In addition to that, they also need to push for a package for, uh, uh, for Africa in terms of aid to support the, the development of, of the continent. On the most specific aspect that I think that we need to be giving attention to in most African country is a broad-based national youth employment program that can absorb the beginning unemployment, unemployed um, youth. If you think in terms of the, 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 the population of the Africa and you think in terms of the youth uh, that account for over 70% of the population, that is people below 30 years old, and if you even think about, if we are to add to 35, I mean, we use 835, that is even going to about 80% of the population. If you think in terms of that population uh, and uh, some estimate put it that in the next five years, uh, African countries will add about 170 million into the workforce. Without compensatory or complementary um, job opportunity in this environment, we can imagine the crisis that is going to occur in most African countries. So we can see that the need to embark on such um, a broad-based national youth employment program is very important. But my view in this particular area is that this program should be created in such a way that will give opportunity for young people who are unemployed to have a job uh, that will, even though the salary, the wages may not be so high, but it will give them a means of livelihood. But in addition to that, it will also give them opportunity to acquire work-based experience, which is often lacking when you do not have opportunity for a job. And when you are applying for a job at a certain age, they ask for experience, which you do not have because you have never had opportunity. So such will give the youth the opportunity to have that. And it will then get, make it easier for them to have a better, uh, a more sustainable job in the future. So, 
the need to look into that is very, very important on the continent. Then prioritize skill-based education. The skill-based education will really help to, 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 to lift the continent. Now, talking in terms of business, businesses will also need to uh, step up. So unlike in the past where businesses will look locally, domestic economy alone, the COVID environment with digital, with technology has opened a broader open market that um, uh, businesses can begin to explore, be it in form of trade and be it in form of um, uh, opportunity for se selling their services. So this is one area that the businesses will need to pay attention to in terms of post COVID as a way of recovery. I know my uh, other colleagues, we are going to talk a little bit more on uh, this aspect, but especially for Swatini. Now, coming to individuals, there are a number of areas that individuals will need to pay attention to. For instance, individuals would need to look into the type of skill that they are acquiring at this moment. Gone are the days where one should, uh, will go to a higher institution to acquire a degree. Many of the training skills that people acquire today that they have today after COVID will no longer be relevant. So many of those skills will be redundant. So in order for any individual to be relevant, they will need to look into the skills that are going to be viable in the future for the, the, the workforce uh, post COVID. So training of individual, looking into skill-based education, but not just skill, but skill that are relevant. In addition to skill-based, they will also need to look at what skills are available that can be used globally. In addition to that, individuals, especially the youth, will need to begin to think more creatively. Instead of focusing on acquiring skills that will enable them to seek a job for somebody to employ them, there will be need for entrepreneurship-based training and also skills that will enable individuals to be able to acquire uh, to create job for themselves rather than a seeking job. So we hoping that with some of these initiative that the government will put in place, indiv individuals will put in place and uh, businesses will do, it will help to cushion the effect of the COVID. But if the government were to relax and individuals were to relax and businesses were to relax, the effect will be a longer term than what we have to do. I will pause here for a moment so that um, we can have uh, some opportunity for questioning and then we can. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor. Do we have any questions from the uh, audience um, at this point in time on the themes that uh, Professor has spoken about this far? So let me see whether in the chat room there's anyone. So if you want to ask question, you could you do two things. Either you pose the question on the chat room, um, which I will try to monitor, but if I cannot find it, if I, either uh, NS will look at it and read it for me or um, Krista will do. Otherwise, you can also do use the recent function to uh, recent, then we'll be able to call you to answer the, so that you can answer the question. So the recent okay. function. There, there, is a, there is a comment uh, here from Nomtrebo uh, Hatebe. Welcome, Nomtrebo, to the webinar. Um, she says, Thank you, Ernest and the USB, for the webinar. It's interesting to note that we are not have uh, we, we are noting access to finance as one of the requirements to foster recovery post COVID 19. We have noted that in Eswatini, in terms of financial access, we are currently at 87%. Our biggest challenge is now with the appropriate financial services and products, which will increase the quality and welfare parameters for financial inclusion. We have an obligation to ensure that access to finance is indeed change the 
is indeed change the and will indeed change the welfare of a Maswati. Also, we need to advocate for preferential procurement policy for women and youth MSMEs in Eswatini if we are to make an impact in the persistent gender gap as stated in the uh, index. I think uh, the comment that Nam uh, Tebo uh, makes is uh, quite relevant, um, especially if we are to realize the potential that uh, those uh, groups uh, she has mentioned have in, in terms of uh, uh, the impact that they have on the development of uh, rural uh, communities, especially, and uh, other marginalized communities in the country. If these groups of people have sufficient access to the uh, funding, they will be in a position to assist the government in terms of recovery post the pandemic. Um, I think uh, if we were to look at uh, the financial institutions uh, on a on a one by one basis, we will realize that uh, they all have similar requirements for access to funding and uh, that is a viable uh, project. However, the skills needed to develop a feasibility study may be lacking in many of the uh, entrepreneurs. And uh, as a result, um, I would uh, challenge financial institutions to put in place the um, facilities to train people on making uh, viable feasibility studies that can be banned as well. And that's, that, 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 I thought that was a, a very a important point that uh, Norm Sebo uh, had to be mentioned. I think the two points that he mentioned and uh, the one that added is really a very important. So access to finance is, is crucial and that's one of the area that needed reforms would be used. So in a time of crisis like this, if you just uh, mute your, okay, thank you very much. If you look at a time of crisis like this, uh, um, in terms of how do you make finance available? So you will re realize that banking system, because they are risk averse, would almost always withhold or reduce lending. So there will be a credit crunch during such um, a, a period. And if you think in terms of the government capacity to provide the needed lending um, that will be able to cushion, to, 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 to boost the, stimulate the economy, the government may also not have all the capacity to provide the physical, the actual lending. So this is where a partnership between the government and the private financial institution become necessary. So what, how would the partnership work? The banking system, the financial system may have the, uh, some of this finance, but they are reluctant to, to lend. When the government come in, in form of a guarantee, uh, where they also share part of the risk, it will then enable the bank, uh, the financial system to, to lend. So one of the tools that has been used globally in times like this is guarantee scheme. This could be complemented with another form of a form of direct lending by the uh, DFIs in the countries that can then create access to those sector that ordinarily the, the banking sector will not be able to lend to. So, but the guarantee scheme is a very powerful tool in, the, in a time like this. The only thing that needs to be done is that it needs to be designed in a way that will cater for these different risks and needs of businesses and individuals that may need the, the finance for their business to uh, either for startup or for uh, the businesses to grow. So it's very, very important. When you talk in terms of professional, uh, professional uh, procurement policy, so when you look at the, the women and the vulnerable group, including youth enterprises that we, we may look at, if the government really want to promote such uh, businesses, a, pro, a professional uh, a procurement policy would have to be implemented. And such implementation of such uh, policy would then encourage, will enable some of these businesses to take off. But the only thing I would like to say is that it should not, show, it should not be an opportunity to, to, to nurture or sorry, to, 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 to maintain a kind of a, 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 a 
mediocrity uh, in terms of production. So individuals, businesses, even though you are giving preferential treatment in procurement, would also need to step up in terms of the quality of production so that by purchasing from them in terms of the government will not reduce the quality of service that the government will also render to the population. Because if they buy low quality inferior goods from such sector, from the through the procurement uh, process, and the quality is low, it can also affect the, 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 the output that the government uh, will provide. So the individuals, the private uh, sector, especially the targeted group, um, vulnerable group, also need to step up in terms of the quality. And on the feasibility studies and ability to initiate projects that are fundable, I think specialized centers may need to be created that will help small businesses, individuals to create such an opportunity rather than relying just on the banks who are also profit oriented and they may not have the capacity to, for those developments. So if there are independent other uh, intervention that would help to create those capacity, it will uh, complement the effort of the DFIs in particular, as well as the, the commercial banks. Any thank, other uh, comment? Thank you, thank you, Professor. Um, I think you may proceed with the uh, presentation. I don't see any questions uh, in the chat. So, my, actually, my presentation has ended. I was what I was looking for is uh, we can engage more in the conversation because uh, right. because the time limit was very small. I, I had to. <laughs> And narrow it so that we can engage more in a conversation if there is more extra time. So I think I would want to encourage more questions from, uh, there are a lot to share, but unfortunately there, is no, uh, there wasn't time to share so much. So uh, such a conversation questions will bring up many more things. Um, perhaps if I can come in, in Prof. Mishak, Ernest. Um, Perhaps we can give um, Professor Bunang a, an opportunity now for input, and then we can have an integrated question answer um, engagement again, if that is okay with you. I think that will really help because in the future people will be able to synthesize uh, their thoughts and questions and ask more questions. Yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Christelle. Right. Um, ooh. I cannot find my slides. <laughs> Otherwise, you can proceed, um, Ernest. All right. Um, I will thank share, you. Very I will share with you quickly, Ernest, the screen. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to welcome uh, again, once again, all the participants of this webinar. I can see uh, Colin is looking very seriously. <laughs> um, and uh, he's waiting for the next presentation to ask his question. Thank you very much. Um, at this point in time, uh, I would like to welcome Professor Bonang Mohale. Professor Bona. Right, thank you. Uh, Professor Bonang Mohale is a chancellor of the University of the Free State, a professor of practice in the Johannesburg Business School, College of Business and Economics. He is the chairman of the Bidvest Group Limited and author of the best selling book. Lift as you rise. Bonang Mohale was the Chief Executive Officer of Business Leadership South Africa, BLSA, till June 2019, a forum which brings the leadership of South Africa's most successful and influential big business and multinational investors together in dialogue. Thank you very much, Professor Bonang, for making time to participate in this webinar and we look forward to your insight into this subject. Babu Ernest, thank you very much for having me and thanks to the rest of my colleagues who have taken time in their busy schedule on a Friday afternoon uh, to have this dialogue 
with me, and mine is going to be exactly that, uh, a dialogue. <clears throat> I'm told that the value, the utility is in the question and answers and in the conversations. So Professor Mishak and I will be a dance. I'll come up for air um, and then go back into details when so required. But suffice it to say that, you know, the kingdom of Eswatini, Botswana, Lesotho, and Namibia are joined to South Africa at the hip. And as a result, what normally happens in South Africa is influenced, informed, described, shaped by what also happens. That's why we are part of the same economic region as it were. Therefore, if I make comments about South Africa, of course, it's comments about those four um, called the Customs Union or SACU, um, but also for the continent. And if so required, we'll also look at what do the US elections uh, mean for the rest of the world as far as COVID is concerned, because this pandemic is going to defy the presidency of President-elect Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Because this pandemic is unprecedented, it's unrelenting, it's uncertain. It has changed everything. We normally speak of the pandemic and the Spanish flu of 1918, but the reality is that it was 1918 to 1920. It came in two waves, it killed 5 million people. The second wave killed more people than the first wave. In South Africa, when the pandemic came, when we were gifted with our index patient on the 5th of March, the president, Madame Elasir Ramaphosa, then announced restricted travel for non-essential travel. And since then, he spoke to us on the 23rd of March to usher in alert level number five, effective midnight the 26th. So you and I, we only woke up effectively on the 27th of March. We thought initially this was going to take 26 days. It ended up taking 35. As we speak today, <laughs> we are eight months of a national lockdown. We are still in alert level number one, 243 days later. It has changed the way we work. This webinar is a demonstration of what has changed. It has changed the way we worship, the way we pray, the way we bury our dead. But it has also changed the way we engage, interact, and interface with each other and one another. In fact, the biggest vaccine, it's not pharmaceutical, is how we, you and I change our behaviors. But at the time that it came to South Africa, South Africa was already prostate phase down, finished by three, and it became the fourth catastrophic event. We had just been downgraded below investment grade by the third of the rating agencies Moody's. But before then, we were actually in a technical recession. Before then, we were just thinking, not actually recovering from the nine wasted years of state capture, where we estimate about 104 trillion US dollars was stolen in four years. And in the nine years on average, a hundred billion South African rands were siphoned off only to the two Zupta families. So the problem we are currently having in the world, in Africa, 1.3 billion people, 55 countries that speak 2000 languages with a continental GDP of 6 trillion US dollars. 
30.3 million square kilometers of pristine coastline where the world has always needed something from Africa, not the other way around. Every single solitary one of the mineral resources that the world needs in this continent is found as either number one or number two. And yet when you look at this pandemic like poverty has a black and a feminine face. So in the world and in South Africa, the, the challenge is threefold. One is the lowest levels of confidence since the Second World War of trust and of hope. So when your people tell you that that is what the problem is, you don't want to act like George W. Bush to say all the 18 people that were involved in 9-11 were of Saudi Arabia extraction. And then you look left and say, we're going to bomb the hell out of Iraq. I think what we need to do is to talk to that challenge. Our people are not saying we need another economic plan. So an economic recovery plan, yes, but another broad socioeconomic plan, especially because in South Africa, we have had six major plans and we are now talking about an economic reconstruction and recovery plan. In the midst of implementing the national development plan, NDP 2030, we still have another 10 years to go. But before that, we actually were gifted with a national growth path that demanded that we do four things. That we need to re-industrialize, we need to beneficiate and therefore localize and create um, black industrialists. When Deputy President Pumbizle Mlamonyuka was in charge she also gave us as Gisa. The first two before then was the growth employment and redistribution strategy plan by President uh, Tabombeki when he took over from our first democratically elected president, Holisatha Nelson Mandela, who had put together the reconstruction and development plan, RDP. Today, when you talk to young people, they think RDP is a house. So under those circumstances, I think what is needed is for us as a people with great natural endowments to say, we are indeed in a spot of bother. We are looking the economic and indeed fiscal precipice because the default on our debt has become real and almost imminent. Our debt to GDP ratio is accelerating towards 100 percentage points. The budget deficit has moved from six to eight, it's going towards 10. Before we know it, by 2030, it will be approaching probably 16 percentage points. Our revenues from the South African Revenue Service with an expenditure of 1.8 trillion South African rands is still hovering around 1.4 trillion, a shortfall of slightly more than 350 billion, precipitated by the fact that the economy has shrunk. A lot of companies have gone out of business. What is collected as corporate taxes has reduced. Of the 16 million people that are gainfully employed, we have lost 3 million just six months into this COVID. The last quarter, 2.2 million people. By yesterday, South African statistics services tells us that the people who are now unemployed is 11 million. And yet we have 18 million people on social security. We've just added another 5.6 million people with just this 350 addition and augmentation of the social grant. So in fact, when you look at the absolute numbers, we are indeed a country of people that are now dependent on social security nets. 
a nation of consumers rather than a nation of producers, let alone a nation of investors, especially when you compare us with our BRICS counterpart, where the level of savings with all the others is above 50 percentage points in South Africa, it's below 15%. What is needed is for us to have a critical, crucial, but nonetheless courageous conversation that says we defeated 350 years of colonialism, 98 years of separate development, 48 years of apartheid because we had a common enemy called apartheid. All of us were galvanized, mobilized, agitated and orchestrated towards that common enemy. Today, what is our new common enemy? This notion of common purpose for common good, acting in the best interest of South Africa Inc., not in our own best interest. My grandmother used to say to act in your best interest, you have to act first in the best interest of others. So when the people who call ourselves our leaders, now start stealing from the poor and hungry, sick and dying, then you know that we have lost our moral compass and the plan is not what is going to save us. The 500 billion socioeconomic recovery fund that was put together and the creation of the solidarity fund by private business was to respond to the pandemic at two levels, saving lives and focusing on PPEs and preserving livelihoods to make sure that we don't devastate the economy so much that the recovery is longer than the 36 anticipated months. At this rate, even in 36 months, I doubt that any of the countries in the world bar only those that are led by women, the seven of them, will actually reach pre-COVID levels in 36 months. For the rest of us, I think it's going to be much longer than that. So that common enemy surely can be the stubbornly high levels of unemployment that then lead to increasing levels of poverty, that then lead to increasing levels of inequality. Because these are symptoms. Maybe, just maybe, that new common enemy, because we are at an institution of higher learning, is probably education. Because we have to think much more long term, because that's the surest way of transcending social classes. That's the only way that we can talk about the requisite skills of the fourth industrial revolution of coding of the internet of things, of artificial intelligence, of cryptocurrencies. And we have to be the ones that develop that timber. Maybe, just maybe, because education is the shortest way that in two decades of hard work and application, one can be born in the informal settlement of Alexander across the bridge from the richest square mile in terms of real estate in the continent, where even the tallest building in Africa is located that Leonardo, owned by the Legacy Group, is situated, and be able to afford a house in the leafy suburbs of Bryanston, not because they want a tender, but because they've earned, they deserve it, and they can afford it through education. Therefore, for me, it's about saying all of us are in business today, or at least are aspirant people to go in business and business defined broadly as also including the state-owned enterprises and state-owned companies. What then is going to be our response and what can we do? I'll conclude with just six things. I will not unpack them and then shut up and then we can take questions and answers. When I went to the Ivy League universities in my youth, mostly American institutions, the definition of economics was sh shareholder maximization. 
in the 21st century, if you did and thought of that only, I think you'll be missing the point. One of the key challenges facing boards today is to ensure that corporate decision-making is consistent not only with the whims of the shareholders, but it takes into account the society, the community where it's located, thereby a broader stakeholder community, including the commitments made by the executives. Therefore, under those circumstances, we have to talk about this notion called shared value. This notion of focusing on ESGs as the national development goals, sustainable development goals of the United Nations. Therefore, the first role of business must be to bring about this notion of, of shared value. The second role is to survive. Because if you can survive this pandemic and emerge the other side, you are already profitable. And you survive by preserving cash and strengthening your balance sheet. The third role of business for me is to ensure that more than anything else, we do no harm. No harm to our own employees, no harm to the communities where we're located, no harm to the environment. Especially because as we speak, there's 13 trillion US dollars in the developed world that is looking for a home because the whole of the Northern Hemisphere is already experiencing what scientists call their second wave. Some would even argue maybe their third wave. And they can invest at home. They are looking mostly at emerging markets. And the most complex, the most resilient, not just sustainable, and the most diverse in the continent happens to be South Africa as a springboard for the rest of the continent. Therefore, this notion of doing no harm to make sure that HSSE as an acronym for health, safety, security, and environment is taken seriously by the businesses themselves, because they were the systems and processes to be able to do that. That our employees come to work every day with 10 fingers on the end of their two hands. They need to go back to their significant others every afternoon with 10 fingers at the end of their two hands. To do anything less would have failed them. But doing no harm sounds a bit passive. The fourth role of business, I think, is to ensure that we make the world a better place. That's more active because it's not so much that we have inherited this earth from our forebears as we borrowed it from our children. Therefore, it behooves us to live it in a condition and a state that is substantially better than we found it in. South African constitution is called the best in the world. Not because we are clever, because we borrowed unashamedly from the rest of the world. We borrowed from the Canadian constitution about how we empower women. We borrowed from Malaysia about the Bumiputra experience, how the indigenous Malay people were excluded from the economic mainstream, run, managed, and owned mostly by people of Chinese extraction and how in a period of 20 years, that was indeed equalized, harmonized. 26 years into democracy, poor people have become poorer, rich people have become richer, and the inequality has become glaring. The people of Alexander and Soweto are still mellowing in the self-perpetuating vicious cycle of abject poverty. The last two is to ensure that we focus on this notion called economic growth, GDP growth I'm talking about. Because if the economy is not growing, very soon we'll be talking about the redistribution of poverty, not the redistribution of wealth. There is no possession more important than land. 26 years into democracy, 90% of black people still own 
less than 13% of the land. And yet the biggest parcels of land is owned by government. And in 26 years, they've not seen it fit to redistribute this, to give this asset class, because land is indeed the fourth means of production. There's three and a half million people in Soweto, 950,000 in Alexander. If you gave every single solitary one of them a title deed on Tuesday, on Friday, they're able to go to the bank, leverage this and start their own small and medium enterprises because the biggest constraint, irrespective of what we are told, is still access to finance. When you go to the bank, you've got a brilliant idea. It is bankable and saleable. They still want your grandmother and collateral and they want to know how you were toilet trained. Let me conclude, Bra Ernest, by saying, I talk only about business, not what's expected of government, because business has a disproportionate voice. In South Africa, they still employ 13 and a half million people. When government employs 2.3 million in the three spheres of government. I talk about business because it has a disproportionate voice. Business can spell this notion called project management, how to deliver a mega project on time, on budget and in full. Because business cannot continue to be an island of prosperity in a sea of poverty. When your own employees cannot afford the goods and services that you provide, then you have a problem. I focus on business because business must continue to do well by doing good. The two are not mutually exclusive. It is not either or, it is both and together at the same time, simultaneously, concurrently, and in parallel. It is business that needs to say, but what are the skills that we need post COVID and start putting those in place rather than looking at government and say, you give them to us. It is business that says, if we want a workforce that is differently skilled, upskilled and reskilled, that can help us to reimagine and repurpose our economies post the COVID so that we don't have and hunker at the old way of doing things and we call it the old normal. And we're looking forward to the new normal business can help us to say, but how can we together co-create and co-craft a better normal by growing their own timber, by focusing on education, because when one steadily burns the midnight oil, one gains access to the domain of knowledge and wisdom, the world of meaning, the world that cannot be conquered without a persistent crusade. But Ernest, I'm happy to take questions and answers and even some violent disagreements. <laughs> I, I hope they will be less violent uh, than uh, um, uh, th than you think. Um, thank you very much, Professor, for the um, insight that you have shared with the webinar uh, today. And I see that uh, there are quite a number of questions, but if I may start um, with my own. Um, I, I, I see that uh, you you have uh, spoken about uh, the different uh, segments uh, in the economy that can um, uh, assist in the uh, development or reconstruction uh, phase. How can small economies access funding under this risk averse uh, character of our banking institutions? Um, I'm saying this because quite a number of uh, African con uh, economies uh, are not as large as the economy of South Africa. I'm sure that's a question for my learned friend, Professor Mishak. Yes. Um, after that, I will add um, what we are doing in South Africa, Brian, Ernest, with your permission. Yes. <laughs> You are on mute. Sorry, I was on mute. Could you please, uh, uh, Ernest, could you please repeat the question again? I was taking another question when uh, you were raising that question. Okay. Um, the question is, how can small economies access funding uh, from the financial institutions 
while they still continue under the character of uh, risk averseness. So uh, let me let me look at this. With there are two layers of the the question, if we were to uh, calibrate it, the first one is as an as a country, how can you raise uh, funding? So, as a country which typically can be led by the the, uh, the, the government or by the, uh, the, the businesses. For the government, there are multilateral institutions or bilateral um, uh, government arrangement that can be utilized, which many have different options. So the World Bank, the AF AFDB, that is African Development Bank, and many of these multilateral institutions are there that provide funding. Um, uh, in many questions, they have different product, many funding opportunity, and especially in a time like this, they have created so many uh, emergency funding that governments will need to explore. And whichever one that is available at this point in time, we need to be targeted and uh, uh, utilized uh, effectively. On the other hand, from the private sector point of view, they can also look for opportunity that are available within the, the, the multilateral and um, other uh, international uh, agencies that are available to promote businesses, to promote lending to businesses, so which they can tap into and opportunity to partner um, in businesses too can be explored. Having talked about that, we can now come to the level of within a country. Within a country, there are funding, opportunity that's available. So the government will raise taxes. As I have alluded to, and uh, Professor Muhali has also alluded to, the fact that businesses are not making sufficient profit now, and that the economy has shrunk, means that the avenue for uh, tax revenue, public uh, for, um, revenue is decreased. And with that, it will be difficult for government to raise so much funding. So they may have to look for external avenues to be able to uh, generate such um, uh, uh, extra uh, funding. In addition to that, increase efficiency with the utilization of the available resources could actually make the available resource go further in terms of uh, achieving the common good of the, of, the, of the government. On the side of the small businesses and individuals that were looking for finance, this is where I mentioned the role of the partnership. Partnership can be utilized uh, in form of a guarantee scheme that uh, government can provide guarantee and small business can be uh, also use it. Let me also mention, somebody raised the question of pension fund. There are funds that are available that often um, uh, in terms of the legislation, uh, because the, the fund were to be preserved, they often are given opportunity to invest wherever they want to invest. I think in a time like this is when, in my view, the government will need to begin to think about how can you make the funds like the pension fund to provide some lending within the economy or providing financing. Of course, they want you to be wary of the fact that if there is corruption and bad management of such resources that is given to the government, it could lead to the collapse of such fund, which means that the future of those who have saved could be ruined. So proper management of those funds is, uh, or utilization of those funds is very important for the repayment. But this is opportunity where the government can say, you can devote a percentage, a significant percentage of it to financing domestic economy rather than investing outside, which would then help to boost or stimulate the domestic economy. So these are some of the, uh, option that can be utilized. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Professor. Um, I have uh, a couple of questions from Nigel, and I would like Nigel to join us in the conversation to express his questions. Nigel, are you there? Yes, I am. I'm just having connectivity problems here. We can hear you well, Nigel. Okay. Please go ahead. We hear you well. We okay. hear you. I, uh, my concern is that 
the banking and the private sector, it's always the issue of risk. But my concern is that uh, there's a disparity because depending on which level you earn, you are charged phenomenal interest rates as opposed to someone with established businesses, they charged less rates because of risk. So couldn't there be an incentive by the government to uh, enable less risk by maybe offering some tax breaks for the banks who are part and party of this partnership with the government to ensure that our youthful entrepreneurs, which are many, are allowed to initiate their ideas as business ventures. I think the private sector depends too much on the government, especially when they for years have raked in millions from the poorest of our societies who are savings. And therefore that whole balance is that whole imbalance needs to be corrected somehow. And the answer is the question has been around for the longest time but we had pains to really tackle the elephant in, in the room. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, you. Major. I don't know whether Professor Mohande want to respond first. Um... So in South Africa, we have the workers' money through the government employee pension fund. It's the biggest asset manager in the continent sitting on 2 trillion South African rents. I think it can be better utilized, Niger. Yeah. But also remember the 500 billion that we borrowed as part of our socioeconomic stimulus in response to the pandemic. Part of it came from the African Development Bank. For the first time, we went to the IMF, these multilateral institutions. But for the rest of us, I think in South Africa, if you are looking for finance, look also at the developmental finance institution. CEDA, C. Uh, National Empowerment Fund, the IDC, the DBSA, especially if you are focused on infrastructure. The issue of risk will always be there, uh, Nigel. Unfortunately, it's like the issue of inequality will always be with us. So the more the banks perceive greater risk, the more collateral they need, but also they cover it by charging you slightly higher interest rates. Lastly, I think for me, I was having a conversation with the people of Alexander by way of example, and they're saying we're coming to big business. We need a million rent to organize the Alexander Sentin Marathon. If I wasn't black, I would have gone to Investec, Stephen Kosef and Fanny Titi and to Discoveries, Adrian Go or to Hollats, Adrian Enthoven to say, here's a million rent, to them it's nothing. But it is the philosophy is the dependence. Yep. I said to them, how many people are we expecting 10,000 runners and you need a million rand? I said, yes, there's your answer. That's 100 rand entry fee for any one of the 10,000. There's a million. When you think internally first, you are less dependent on others. I think as Africans, we need to think that way. Ethiopia, the only country in the continent that was never colonized, never is a long, uh, it's a long time. In the Bible, it's called Mesopotamia. They built the biggest hydroelectric dam uh, in the continent called the Renaissance Dam. Every single soul to one of the money raised, they got from their own citizens. One dollar here, 50 US cents there, and they didn't have to go to, to these institutions. I then said to them, after you have raised that million, so that you bank your profit, go to every single soul to one of the businesses that are invested in Alexander that are black and you go to the mall, but also go to the churches. It's amazing these evangelical churches, how much money they collect in one weekend. That's why their pastors can have private jets and 18 cars and go to them and say, what are you prepared to put in? Lastly, I said, you can go to a Power FM, which is black owned and Kaya FM, which is black owned. Before you go to talk radio 702, which is part of the prime media stable to say, you publicize the event. When you start by looking internally, you'll be amazed at how much resources we want. And I say that because if we don't think for ourselves, we play our, our future in the hands of others. It is up to us to create our own new world. So if you want to start a business and you're thinking about funding and you're talking about 50,000, rather than go to Simpiwe Chabalala Standard Bank, look at your five family members and say, here's an idea 
Why don't we do crowdfunding as a family? That's how you create businesses. I say that because we need to continue to build our own businesses to hire our own children. It's madness to continue to make babies and then we send them across the bridge to send in to say, go to the different neighborhood on your knees to ask for a job from somebody else. Prof? Thank you so much, uh, Professor Muhale. I think you, you, you made the point very well. I think the aspect that I would like to contribute uh, to what you have said, when you talk about looking inward, I, I will probably uh, uh, expand on that inward looking in terms of the role of technology. So one of the avenues that has emerged, uh, if you look at what happened in Kenya in terms of Mpesa, um, Mpesa was developed as an intervention to ensure that there is a, a payment mechanism because it was a cash, uh, the economy was a cash society where people carry cash and the risk are still with it. So eventually they come up with a payment system, a person to person, which makes it easier for people to transact, uh, do transactions. But eventually it became clear that with such uh, uh, um, uh, mechanism, we could actually have reserves in form of a wallet, a savings. And by virtue of this opportunity, many people who could not have access to the banking system to save now are able to amass so much saving in a collective way, which become a huge resource that the country can use to finance the economy in form of uh, available uh, capital. So I did not go into this analysis when I was uh, presenting because of limited time. If you look at one of the biggest problems in Africa, including uh, Swaziland, uh, if we were to bring it down home, if you look at the deposit that the banks are able to mobilize relative to the total economy in terms of GDP, it is a very small fraction. I think if I remember, uh, Swaziland is about less than 20% or thereabout. So if you are dealing with that capacity of saving within the economy, why is it difficult for the bank to mobilize so much saving because many people are in the rural area. And if you look at the mechanism of banking mobilizing saving today, it's uh, focused on the city, the, the, the major um, uh, um, urban areas. And if you are looking at that, majority of the population that are in the rural area who may want to save money, they will not have revenue. So technology will do a lot in enabling mobilization of even the saving that we are talking about which will make it accessible in addition to the crowdfunding that um, Prof has mentioned. Then is the second uh, layer of technology. One of the reasons why the risk is a big challenge for lending is because of the mechanism that the financial system also are using to process, to, 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 to screen potential borrower clients to onboard them. If they are using um, uh, the, the traditional way of screening, will apply, manually, and then they will uh, look at the individuals, screen them, go to the businesses, and so on. It costs a lot. So the transaction can become so high. So either the risk is not particularly high, but the process of establishing that your risk is low will incur a lot of costs. And with high transaction costs, business, banks become averse to lending. So technology can leverage that space. We are, with technology, use of technology in terms of screening on body customers, it can reduce significantly the cost of lending. And if it can reduce the cost of lending, that will also mean that businesses, individuals can have access to um, uh, lending. So digitalization and technology innovation in the financial services industry will really help either in mobilizing more capital savings and then distributing in form of lending, which will create more access within the economy. Thank you very much, uh, Prof, for that insight. I would now like to give Bahati Sanga a opportunity to state his question and uh, make a contribution to this uh, webinar. Um, uh, thanks, Aaron, and thanks, professors, for your uh, presentation. Yeah, I would like we discuss further on the role of uh, private sector, especially the institutional investors in terms of uh, financing. You know, uh, Africa has gone through so many crises and indeed the continent has been resilient. 
Uh, but unlike the other crises where Africa was suffering, but the other countries actually were doing well. But in uh, COVID is a different situation. We've seen countries like Japan, Canada being downgraded. So the support or the aid we used to get might not be the same compared to the other crises. Uh, debt relief or debt cancellation also maybe in a short term might not be available. Of course, for the longer term can, can also be, can, I mean, it's, it's a possibility. And then looking on these DFIs, uh, whether they are regional like the African Development Bank or the multilateral, they have also engaged on selectivity of projects because they realize they don't have enough funding to finance everything. So now they are selecting specific projects. So we are in a situation of actually a credit ration because they want to protect their, uh, their, their rating like the African Development Bank is a triple A. Similarly, even for the other commercial banks with the, the Basel three, where they, they even, all, even if they are collecting the deposits, they still need to raise uh, some money to ensure that actually they, they protect their capital. So uh, I'm trying to look on the short term and looking on a country like an Iswatini, you know, uh, what might be the uh, short term maybe measures which can help the, the country recover particularly on the institutional investors when it comes to, to funding. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Prof. Uh, Azia Kapano, would you like to start? And then I'll give the opportunity to uh, Prof. Uh, Mohale to uh, ventilate on this question. Thank you very much. And uh, Mahati, I thought that was a very uh, interesting question you have just raised. And you actually articulated the, the, the issue so well um, in terms of the challenges that are there. So let, let me come back to the question of in the short to medium term, uh, is it actually possible to, to get uh, debt relief or debt cancellation that we are talking about? Um, and that question has been uh, a, a topic of debate uh, that people have been asking. And for the argument you've, you've actually made, because unlike historically what used to happen, where the, the poor countries are heavily indebted, we cry to the, the big countries and ask them, please help us, because they are rich and they, are they, they, are, they, they have a heavy net worth, they can help. But unfortunately, if you think in terms of even the, the rich country like America, if you think in terms of the relief packages that they have uh, introduced, over three trillion, trillion now, and they are even adding, to, we are going to add to it, and we don't know the end yet. So if you think about those, what are they? They are largely debt. So it, it's not only that they have their, their, their debt level have gone beyond the 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 hundred percent threshold, but it's even more than that. It will be more than that. So the the ability to finance or to come to the aid of developing country is reduced. But here is the point. I think when I look at the global picture of what is going on now, it's typical of a typical world war where there is a global war, and where so many damages have been caused, and then everybody is poor. Now the question is that if everybody remain in that state and everybody try to struggle to come out of that uh, devastated state, it will never happen. So there need to be intervention. So my proposal when I think in terms of the way to, uh, to, to come out of the debt crisis is to say countries, we need to come together. So both the developed and the developing country, everybody has to come together. And we have to come to a term that we can use to see how we manage the debt. In this package of the negotiation that would then help to, uh, to ease the, the, the burden on individual, 
which either could be a, a, a negotiated debt that could be for a very long term, which will make the repayment easier. It could also mean that for developing country, for African country where already they are in a terrible situation, can they make a case in that whole package for a debt cancellation, which will give them a relatively safer uh, uh, um, uh, having to start in terms of their development. Otherwise, if they continue with the burden and the repayment, it will be difficult. So that is the spirit of what the argument I'm making. We have experienced a war situation. The difference between this one is that the infrastructure, the fiscal infrastructure, unlike in the case of a war, has not been destroyed. So it is relatively easier with some injection of capital to, for the economy to, 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 to take off. Hence, the package, all of us, let's come together and negotiate. Some may have to pay, but let's look at how we ease the payment over time. I don't know whether I should pause here first. Uh, Professor Mohani would, I see have a point to make under the, the rating and when it comes to individual uh, 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 financial institution, but I would like to give opportunity to Professor Mohani first. Maybe Prof, after the rating questions, then I will wrap up the two questions with one or two comments. Please proceed. <clears throat> Thank you so much. So, so if you think in terms of a typical uh, financial system, whether a, a development bank or a commercial bank, of course, they have to be sustainable. That is a key, um, especially that is prefer, uh, very common with the, 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 the the DFIs where sustainability is a key. And on the case of the, 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 the commercial bank, the safety of the bank is core to them. Because if you are a CEO or the management of a bank, you do not want the bank to collapse. You want it to be safe as you are lending. While you try to maximize profit, to maximize return and so on and so forth, the shareholders value, um, Professor Mohale has mentioned that that, the, that is not the, uh, should not be the core objective now. Uh, doing good is part of it. But the bottom line is that the safety of the bank is very important. And the capital is one of the key. The unfortunate or probably fortunate aspect of this capital, the requirement to maintain certain capital is not a matter of a choice on the part of the financial institution. These have been detected by regulations which of course of all the sectors in the economy, the banking sector are the most regulated and learning and borrowing from international regulation practices like the Basel Accord requirement, which stipulate the capital requirement that bank must have depending on your, your operation, the size, the, your, 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 whether how dominant are you and so on, your relevance, global relevance or dominance, mean that you have to operate in a way that you preserve the capital to ensure that you are not penalized by this requirement that you must comply with. So that automatically forces banks to ensure that their lending is, is they, 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 they have this um, credit rationing that we are talking about to preserve the capital. So it is not just a case of they want to, but it's a case of the regulation so how can we handle this? And this is where I'm emphasizing the partnership because as long as the regulatory environment is still tough in terms of capital requirement, because we know why they would do so, the regulations are uh, insisting on them. If a, a typical commercial bank were to go uh, under, we know the effect it will have on the economy. We remember what happened during the global financial crisis. If a, a bank, the contagious effect of it within the economy and even spreading to other countries could be devastating. So regulations are there to preserve them. And the managers of the banks are very conscious of that fact that if they were to make mistakes in their lending, which do not preserve the capital and they comply with the regulation, they will be penalized severely. So for that reason, they want to do that. So how can we bypass this to situation, especially when it comes to the commercial bank, um, private uh, uh, commercial bank. First, in the absence of regulation that will relax because of the safety of the bank, uh, the, 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 those requirements, the, the government institution 
or sorry, government can now come in in form of a guarantee, a partnership to reduce the risk of the lending, the borrowers, because with that reduction of the risk, it becomes easier for the bank to extend because extend lending because they know that even if the customer were to default, it would be easier for them to continue because there is a guarantor who will be able to pay the, 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 the amount defaulted. So that will help the, the bank. Coming to the, so a guarantee scheme will, will be one of the instruments. Of course, there are other interventions that could help. Coming to the DFIs in particular, a major challenge that they have is sustainability. How can you be sustainable? So if you think about how DFIs operate, typically the sponsor or the, the, the owner, we, we typically government, we give them seed capital. It's not on an annual basis. After the seed capital is given, you are meant to be sustainable and to expand lending, usually to the middle space, the, the missing middle where there is high level of risk. If you are charged in that situation, you are balanced with two things, heavy risk and sustainability. So what do you do? You know that for you to go back to the government to ask for more capital, it is not easy. And if you do not have a good rating to look for private lending, with borrowing from other institutional uh, lenders uh, or multilateral institutions, it's not going to be easy. So your rating is very important to you to be able to uh, uh, secure uh, capital for your business. And if you are to go to the government, one of the key requirements is the impact of what you are doing in terms of your, your, your development impact, which the government is going to be looking for. Now, in balancing these two, the DFIs often target a safe haven where they can lend and be sure that they recoup their money. And this is where risk aversion also become a phenomenon with the DFIs. So how can we help in this area? There are a number of proposals that I, 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 I have. One is the fact that the capitalization of DFI should be robust. Often they are undercapitalized and with limited capitalization, it is difficult. Secondly, the governance of the DFI need to improve. The issue with governance also has to do with government intervention. So if government also intervene and create problem for the uh, interfere with the operation of the, the, the DFI, it makes it difficult for the, bank, the DFI to be able to operate in a more um, um, objective way. So that affects them. And that also means that with pressure from the government, with pressure in terms of interference, it affects the ability to lend in the way that is more productive. So if the governance can be secure so that they have independence when it comes to lending and they are well capitalized, they will be able to do better good in the society in terms of providing asset to finance than what they are doing now. Right. Thank you, Prof. Bonan. Just a few lines just to bring it together then because I'm talking to business people here. So what the rating agencies are looking for is really four things. The strength of the economy, fiscal strength, and institutional strength. Lastly, susceptibility to major risks. Can it hit you and you are still able to survive? So put that aside. If you are a board of a company, you are also looking at a few things. Over and above probity and stewardship, you are looking at the duty of care, skill, and diligence. The one we don't talk often about is the duty of faith. Can normal society have faith in these institutions? Not after what happened in Stellenbosch with uh, Marcus Yoster, um, the shenanigans at Tongat, and with Bain and Mackenzie, et cetera, that they don't really inspire confidence, not just the capture in the public sector. Lastly, I think when you look at how then do banks manage this thing that they call risk, remember, it is also part of your governance as a board. Because if you say, which are the four control functions that I have to make sure that I sleep better at night? One, it's risk management. 
Number two is compliance. Number three is, do you have an internal audit so that I can place some reliance on it? And then if you are a bank or financial services, generally they are talking about actuary. So you put all of those together, it says, it is about supply and demand. It's about risk and reward. So when you approach a bank, you need to say, I've got this idea that I'm going to go ahead with it with or without you. But if you do, here's what's in it for you. You need to answer that question. Here's what's in it for you. And once you can do that, then you'll be able, I think, to have better access to finance. But Ernest, there were three other questions I think that were raised on the chat line. I'll just read them out very quickly. There was a piece around corruption, a piece yes. around pension funds, and then a piece around the 200 billion that government gave to businesses. How much of that has been deployed? So the first one, less than 20% has been deployed. On the second one, around the pension funds. You see, this is where it's really tragic. Majority of workers in South Africa are black. The asset managers, the people who control this money are not. And the investments, where is this money invested? It's not Ikukule to Langanyanga, Emon, Law, um, and Nutu in the dusty hills of Kwazulu-Natal. No, the pension funds build Sentin City. They are building shopping malls where the workers are not benefiting. So when labor realized this, that's when they agitated and orchestrated for a move from pension funds to provident funds, away from a defined benefit fund to only a defined contribution to say, no, we also want to get our dirty paws on this money. That's why today the Secretary General of the Union ends as much as a CEO of a company, has a company car and a driver. They also drive around with security. So we have created a new elite Whereas really harnessing, mobilizing workers' funds for their own personal growth and development to improve their quality of life, to take the bottom half from the bottom into the middle class. I think all of us would sleep better at night when majority of people have something to lose. In, as I conclude, there's an African adage that says, a child that is not enveloped by the village will burn it down in order to feel its warmth. Back to you, Ernest. Thank you very much. Um, I think you have covered uh, quite a number of uh, the questions that I wanted to raise. Is there anyone else, uh, maybe Doug, you want to expand on your question? Douglas Davis. So whilst we're still waiting for another question, let me ask Professor Misha to say a word or two about corruption. Whatever he leaves out, I might put in a word edgewise. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, there was also another thing that I wanted to mention as, as a way of um, uh, balancing this uh, dilemma of the poor versus the rich. Uh, I will come to that uh, and I will use an example. So. Coming to corruption, of course, corruption is a leakage from the system. And wherever you have a leakage, then it will always be a problem in any system. So when the environment enables corruption and allows corruption in whatever form it is, then it leads to poor utilization of the limited available resources. So the resources, we do not have an unlimited resources. And even if we were to have an unlimited resources, if there are leakages in that resources, then it will not achieve much good. But in a certain way, we have a very limited resources. And if there are significant leakages, then of course, the good that it will achieve will be very minimal. And that is point, that, that, that's why the need to plug the hole to, 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 to stop it is very important. And that has to do with a lot of, a number of institutional development, the rule of law, how to apply, and the, 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 the level of accountability and transparency in terms of um, government uh, institution operation is very, very um, uh, important. There are quite a number of examples that one can give in terms of 
ensuring a level of transparency that will in, it will reduce um, corruption. So this regional development is very central. I know Professor Muhale will uh, add to that. The other point I wanted to mention, which is, is very important, we did a research on um, uh, on, on social um, um, contribution or protection for uh, poor people. So if you look at the, the government policy that encourage savings today, who is the target? So you and I, for instance, in South Africa, I, do, I do not, have not read anything about that, especially in uh, Eswatini, but it's likely to be the same. All the incentives that are created to, uh, uh, to encourage savings, who are they targeting? The already privileged and rich individual. And what are some of these incentives? So for instance, if you in South Africa were to have, um, apart from your normal contribution to pension fund or your provident fund, if you were to then have um, uh, additional saving in form of contribution to retirement annuity, you will get tax benefit. In other words, depending on the amount that you have saved, the additional contribution, you will then have um, a tax refund on the basis of that. In other words, you are giving back part of your money, which is a gift on the part of the government, depending on the proportion of what you have saved. Now, let's look at the poor that do not have opportunity to save. So they cannot contribute to pension fund or provident fund. So they have no saving for their future. And they also do not have the means to save by contributing to retirement annuity. Now, what incentive is there that encourages the poor to save that also reward them for saving? None. This is where I think uh, um, support for the poor and incentive for the poor to save should come. So one of the, five, the, the study we did suggests that if the poor are given a matching saving, so if you save a hundred, um, is it Lilangani or the land, then you will be given a complimentary um, hundred as a, a gift. Because the poor, are, the rich are already, already getting that in form of tax relief, uh, so tax return that um, the benefit that they get from their savings. If government can create such incentives, it will help, it will make the poor to own their own, uh, take the, 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 the responsibility of saving as their own personal one, because it will benefit them. So if you save a thousand, you get a, a thousand rand in return. And maybe it for a targeted purpose so that it will not be abused. In that way, there will be increase in saving, which will also empower the poor and also help them to come up a uh, poverty level. So, but at the moment, this kind of incentives is not available for government, um, for, for the poor, which is not helping the poor to come out of poverty. Oh. Thank you very much, um, Professor. You have raised uh, quite pertinent uh, issues here that are a, a fodder for thought uh, for all of us uh, that are participating in this webinar. Um, the, there was a, a comment that uh, Namkabe made regarding policy. Uh, I wonder if Namkabe is still here, if we can take uh, this one last comment uh, regarding uh, policy. Thank you, Ernest and Prof Meshak and Prof Wanang. Um, my name is Namke Bohateba, I think. Um, just quickly, I'm a policymaker, but also with um, expertise on financial inclusion. I did make an assertion on policy. One of my biggest challenges I've noted is we sit and we draw up beautiful policies from our desks um, without engaging the people that are supposed to change their lives significantly. Um, we presume we know what their needs and wants are at, at, at a given point in time. Um, we, we need to learn to be more human centric and customer centric whereby we will engage um, the, the people that we are apparently designing policies for. Um, that was, it was basically a comment. We sit with glossy policy statements, but do, are they really making a change in the lives of ordinary Emma Swati in this case? I think I'd like to stop there, Ernest. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, at this point in time, we, we have about 10 minutes left on this webinar. Um, Christelle? Ernest, if there are no more questions to our presenters, I think we can conclude because we had one speaker um, that was not able to join us. Yes, I, I think quickly to uh, Nomstabo's um, uh, comment. Yes, you mind, you, I spent a few minutes on that. Um, so you yes, are too. absolutely right. I think I will actually want to tease the question uh, or, or the point a little bit um, uh, differently from what you said. So it is not just a case of you as a policymaker sitting in your office, try to design a policy for Eswatini. If that was actually the case that you, who is in Eswatini, who, under, who knows the people of Eswatini is trying to design that policy for Eswatini, to a very large extent, that policy will reflect largely the needs of Eswatini. But what typically happens in many of the policies that are being implemented is that you will have this consultant that will come from Europe or America who have done this work and will come and design this and cite the example, it worked in Brazil, it worked in South Korea, it worked in Chile, it worked in so so and so place, and then bring it and impose, bring it to you. And your CEO or your, your, your minister said, wow, this is a good idea, please do it. And then you as a policy uh, maker, you will try to see how you can find, fine tune it and then you will implement it. That is often the problem that what is introduced are not actually from the, uh, the context of the country. So my view, and this is one of the things that we'll be promoting in our development finance training, that we want to focus on enterprise level where we help people to understand the design of policy from a domestic point of view with understanding of the context. Hence, they can own the design. So you as an individual who is developing the policy will be able to design it and be able to implement it because you understand the philosophy behind how to design such policies. And I think that is what is often lacking the capacity to be able to develop those policies and design them, then follow through in implementation. When a policy is imposed, often what then happens is that as at the time the policy is implemented, we we'll soon realize that it does not work for the community we are designing it for. So, mm -hmm. key point I'm taking here from here is that countries should be able to develop that capacity to develop policy. We can learn, like uh, Professor Muhali has mentioned, we can learn from other countries in terms of like the constitutional development, learn from other countries what has worked and then see how can we, looking at our domestic context, adapt this and then modify it to suit our environment. If you do it yourself and based on the context and knowing what you know and interact with people in the economy, it will work. It will work better. Probably there will still be some challenges, but in that respect, it will work better than an imposed um, a program or policy from abroad. Thank you very much, uh, Prof, for that insight. And uh, at this point in time, I would like to uh, thank all uh, the participants in particular. I'd like to thank the insights that have been brought into this conversation by the wealth of knowledge from the two professors, uh, Professor Mishak Aziakpona and uh, Professor Bonang Mohale. My take home on this conversation is that uh, everything that we have spoken about today revol revolves around the common purpose doing things to the best interest of others, not of self. Uh, oftentimes that will uh, give us uh, more impetus to develop together. The other point that I would like to take home with me is that uh, policymakers should look at incentives on encouraging and motivating the poor to make savings so that when they are enabled to uh, participate actively in the economy, they have something that they can draw on to continue to live. And uh, with those words, I'd like to thank you very much for your participation and also um, 
the questions that have been posted through have been uh, quite phenomenal in, in encouraging and, and, vo and uh, embellishing the knowledge that we have uh, picked up uh, today. And uh, with those words, I'd like to um, give this podium to Christelle to say the final uh, word. Thank you so much, Ernest. Unless there's another concluding remark from one of our speakers, Professor Mishak Punang. Any other concluding remarks from your side? <coughs> Only because you are twisting our arm to say so. Uh, <laughs> we were quite, quite happy. But here's a reflection for me. This COVID, what it has done is to pose the question when fisher women and fishermen can't go out to sea for whatever reason, they repair their nets. What are we doing as Africans to repair our own nets? To make sure that when we emerge out of this, Africa is not continuously referred to as a dark continent because it is 1.4 million people are still in darkness. When we think of poverty, it's associated with this continent. When we think about wars and coup d'etats and everything that is not good, it's associated with this continent. And yet the biggest form of corruption, which is defined as bribery, stealing and cheating, the leakage that the prof is talking about, it's actually when the Americans released their slaves under Jefferson, and they spoke about this notion of 10 acres of land and a mule was never codified into war. When we talk about this electoral system in the US of A, Pennsylvania is 20, but Nevada has seven because they've not rectified the fact that the slave masters have still abrogated for themselves the votes of the slaves and they add it onto theirs that's why it's not just absolute numbers. What are we doing when COVID gives us that opportunity to interrogate this nation that posits itself as the custodian of democracy and seamless handover? Because at this rate, Zimbabwe will probably levy sanctions against the United States of America for not observing the outcomes of the elections. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. very much for that enthusiastic and wise words. Thank you, Ernest, for being our very eloquent facilitator for the discussion and for holding us together like this. We appreciate it to all our participants for your really, really exciting um, comments and deep thought was behind these. I can see this really created a space this afternoon for some deep thinking. Thank you to our speakers you for, for allowing us to share this time with you and in your wisdom. It was really great, great. It gives us a lot of food for thought further. Thank you so much. Um, all the best for you for the remainder of this busy end of year. And may you have a wonderful peace time of rest and peace and um, relaxation ahead of you. We hope a little bit. Thank, Thank you. you and bye bye. Well done. Thank you so much. Bye bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye bye, everyone.